Morning. Happy Friday. I think I'm one of the few people in this world that uh, gets a little less happy on Friday because I don't get to play the game again tomorrow, but we'll wait till Monday. That's why Sunday's super happy because we get ready for Monday. But uh, happy times, happy days, as we'd say in Ireland. Happy days because India hit a new high, Q's hit a new all time high. It took, you know, bloody well took the Q's all the way back to 2021 to find those highs. You know, um, again. And again and again, <laughs> we didn't have you bag holding or wearing cues, you know, to the lows of 2022. We do it differently. We don't nail everything, but we don't get you nailed is the point. And um, it is good to be long India. India put up an 8.4% GDP number. Yeah. If you don't know how big that is, you, you just got to know. Howard, it's big to be in Florida on a Friday. It is. It feels good to be in Florida. I'm not here much longer, unfortunately. Um, three things for me, though, Keith, this morning, between Cava, uh, Portillo's, and I forgot the last company, three three restaurant companies, Portillo's, Cava, and I forgot the one, $580 million was raised in between secondary and um, reg between uh, registered and not registered offerings, $580 million of insider selling this quarter in just this week alone in the restaurant space. Wow. Second thing is um, uh, we got the numbers out of <clears throat> Beyond Meat this week, and they basically said they're going to raise equity and not go bankrupt. And then today they announced they can't file their 10K. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you just can't make this up. And the stock's up 50% in the last month. I think it was up 30% of the day. I mean, just... <laughs> And then lastly, for me, Sweet Greens reported last night, 5% comp, it beat the street pretty, pretty handily, 5% uh, price of, I'm sorry, 6% comp, 5% price, 1% mix. So uh, they beat the numbers pretty handily. You can do that when you're raising prices aggressively. The conference call was all bullish around the um, infinite kitchen, which they're going to remodel their stores and add all this technology in, which lowers labor costs and improved margins. But there's one question that nobody would ask on the call and that is what happens to depreciation in the, on your income statement when you invest all this technology in your stores and back of the envelope because i don't know the exact answer but back of the envelope i'm going to say that nearly all the labor benefits they get from taking labor out of the stores because you're putting technology in will be mitigated by higher depreciation amortization so uh no change we'll have a updated thesis for sweet greens for us this morning but there's no change it's stock's going to be up a little bit this morning but uh and they do think they can be profitable next year but they have unable been unable to hit any guidance they've given since being a public company so yep. uh we like howard likes therefore the, and the signal likes let's just reorder that the signal likes and howard likes kava if you're looking for a Restaurant IPO, that's the one, C-A-V-A. -A. Um, all right, good, thanks. Um, Biolsi, you're like kind of like a fan favorite now. You got like sexy stock, you know, it's Celsius. Only 24 hours ago, I mean, and, and a lot of people said this on Twitter. Uh, and otherwise, like if I was if I was a Hedgeye subscriber, I wouldn't tweet shit. Right. Like I just keep it to myself. So because I just selfishly want the alpha. I don't want everybody else to know where I'm making money. Yeah. Um, and that's what the buy side, of course, does as well. They don't tweet um, just. Yeah. You know, but some people participate out loud. We're fine with that. And, and a lot of people are complimenting you on this because you could have bought this in the free market down. Yeah, I, it was it was a day. I had a day yesterday for sure. <laughs> and, uh, have to enjoy it when it happens. Right. And look, you, you, we can hear you this morning. Your connection's good. Yeah, I just, uh, I thought you were going to be exhausted, man. Well, I'm, I'm grateful he gave me a minute to fix the uh, technical issues I had yesterday so I can go over both Synopta and, and Celsius. You know, for the pitch, I had to convince Eric that my Wi-Fi would be fine, but, you know, I, I really had no idea. I did that from a service hallway on my knees in order to get that Celsius pitch out there. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, I, I really wanted to get that story out there. You know, it's my top long, so, um, but, you know, we have to move on, right? So I think... The next Synopta can be Perigo, P-R-G-O. Not immediately, of course. Um, you know, wait for the signal, your signal. Uh, you know, we have some time, but I think you know, Synopta sold off because of bad business. Uh, you know, they sold they sold off a bad business that the street didn't really understand how much it would help them. It's like getting rid of a teammate. You don't realize how good a team can be, in, in, in this case, a company, right? 
and they still don't. So that's that's Synopta. Um, but for Perigo, in terms of you know a problem being one time, it's not an impaired business, but the market is treating the EPS revision like it's a structural you know impairment to that business. It's going to come back sooner than the market expects. So that's that's one for the next the next time. So maybe I got some people's attention for Synopta. Keep keep Perigo on the radar and watch watch for your signal. And I think uh, I think that one will be next. The CEO. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you got people, you get people's attention, all right. I mean, the only way uh, Perigo could potentially be a Synopta is if it blows up, right? And it has. So you have, because it's not like Synopta didn't go from the teens to like three or four bucks a share. And now it's it's breaking out to bullish trend again. So again, there it's it, this is, these are very good examples of you know having the patience to wait and watch, but not take them off your. Like these are all pieces of inventory on on my screens, right? Like to me, they're just tickers. And one day, just like yesterday on STKL, which is Synopta, uh, I'll see an immediate term trade and trend breakout that, you know, I don't have to wear Synopta from 15 to three or four. I get to buy it at six or seven. And that's fine. You know, like our process isn't built to buy bottoms. Like I've tried it. It's a very stinky business picking bottoms. Um, And it's 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 like low probability. And I don't know what else you need. But for me, I prefer to stay with. Again, especially in this day and age when the machine really punishes losers and perpetuates winners. Like the machine loves momentum, you know, both ways. So that's, uh, you know, I'll be, I'll, I'll certainly be paying attention to PRGO. Yeah, I've never heard that picking bottoms is a stinky business. So the, the CEO um, bought stock yesterday at Perigo. So that's something else to flag. Well, there you see, he, 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 uh, the machine doesn't care about him, but, you know, it's, it's, he cares. That's good. You want to yeah. see that. All, All right. right. Is that it? And- uh, no, so I, my note, we don't have to go in detail. My note today has comments on, on Bud and Uts, you know, short Bud, buy Uts. The quick on Uts is UTZ is the symbol. The setup for Uts in 2024 is the best the company's had in like four years. Um, you know, they've been really hit with supply chain and, and inflationary surge. It's really hard for them to raise prices and deal with the, the shortages they had. So this is the best setup they have, and I don't think they're going to waste it. So they've set up a nice guide, beat and raise. Um, and the details are in my note. That's it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Jenks. Hey, good morning, Keith. Wanted to talk about Macau GGR trends because we do have finalized February uh, data. I think we need to look at February and January in conjunction as we as we compare uh, versus pre-COVID period. Last year, the, the Macau market was still opening, so the year-over-year comps are a, a little bit wonky, but but either way, it looks like the, the headline number is maybe a little bit light of what was being circulated as consensus expectations. I, I kind of laugh because the Macau market and the dynamics with, you know, modeling monthly numbers and stuff like there's not a real consensus because we no longer have the same visibility intramonth that we used to have before COVID where there were multiple consultants in the market and you had a better feel for you know, what te- what activity was uh, across the properties. Instead, there's only one consultant left in the market and there's like four or five people that actually try to model, uh, you know, monthly volatility around around these GGR prints. So it, it, long-winded way of saying, I, I think when you see headlines that say things are below or above consensus, you know, you kind of can ignore them a little bit more nowadays and just focus on really you know, the reality of, of, of the data, or at least as, as, as we see it. And, you know, I think February is a continuation of, of really a, a solid trend. So if you look at January and February together, because you had Chinese New Year shift uh, back into February this year. And if you look at, you know, you got to look at the sort of combined months. So December GGR trends had accelerated from November was down 30, then December was only down 19. By the way, these numbers imply that mass revenues where all the profits are, are actually up versus 19, right? Because you don't have a VIP segment. That business is basically down 80, 90% versus pre-COVID. So November down 30, going to down 19. And then the combination of January and February, you're down mid 20s, actually down 24%. So a little bit of a pullback from, from the December month, right? But an acceleration from where we were coming out of the fall, and into November. And I think if you look at sort of the, uh, you know, an annualized number for what February put up, it's actually the highest rate of, uh, of GGR production on a monthly basis going, uh, going back really since, since before COVID. So I'm coming at this fairly positive because what might be lost on folks is that Chinese New Year was, was really strong. 
Uh, typically, once you come out of the Chinese New Year period, visitation levels fall off and you get a VIP or very high-end gambling uh, component that comes into the market. They don't want the crowds and what have you. That's the historical uh, context. That's what that's what used to happen. I think people are getting a little bit too bogged down and comparing, well, this implies the second half of February was really slow because uh, if we trust our Chinese New Year numbers then and then look at the you know the, the full month and we can imply that the sort of daily volumes were were slower. Well, you're comparing against a period that is entirely different than what is now, which is there is no VIP customer. It's an it's an entirely different market. In fact, it's a much more profitable uh, market uh, than than it was pre COVID. So I think there's a little bit of there's still issues with comparisons and how people look at things. And I think for us, it's you know we could take a step back and take a little bit more nuanced view of of what is actually going on, which is um, you know numbers continue to trend higher. You're going to have a quarter or a month or two where where things pull back a little bit, but generally speaking, and now coupled with the macro uh, looking a little bit better as we as we move further into the year, I think the setup continues to to look really solid. So any pullback on uh, below expectations, I think, needs to be put into context, and the context here is actually really positive. Uh, with uh, and that's my takeaway, at least on on February GGR. So the trend continues to uh, accelerate, and the recovery continues to. Uh, uh, push ahead here in, in Macau. So uh, win is the obvious takeaway uh, that we've discussed, but LVS also looks interesting. And then, you know, I'd argue MGM China for those that can can play uh, the Hong Kong listed names or uh, MGM as well, if you're looking for the Vegas exposure and domestic exposure. Uh, but uh, those three tickers that will be top of mind, but win being really more at the heart of it, given that close to 50% of their consolidated EBITDA is coming from uh, Macau. And that's it for today. I'm not going to tell you that I told you, but earlier in the week, I told you that you were going to tell me this on Friday. This, <laughs> there won't be signal, the, it won't be the last time, Keith. <laughs> this damn it has, signal. It's not the first time. <laughs> I'm telling you these damn signals, you know, from from the gods, you know, fractal Floki God uh, he is. And I, you know, for those of you that don't know how that signal, the signal is built through many, many years of mistakes as a practitioner to front run myself fundamentally. All right. So now now I uh, like a boss, I front run Jenkins and what he's going to say by three or four days from now. I'm going to uh, call him a little later and we're going to talk about quantum mechanics and path integrals. Um, and then, you know, then we're going to go on with our day. OK, uh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff is a great it was a great um, marriage. Uh, we had a last night I sent out a note to the team. You know, what Sean did was he. He, he really, um, you know, put together a, a good, you know, macro to micro note on on win. And for those of you that with a preamble to it, and then for those of you that have investing ideas, which like real time coaching alerts is, is an entirely different product now because we, we've evolved it and learned from it and taken your feedback. And he, these guys create these fantastic, not one pagers, but very easy to consume uh, stock reports so that, you know, uh, like really in a page and a half you know, why you're going to be long win for the long term, or at least as long as we stay with it. So that was excellent research, Sean. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, thanks. Well, it's, it's, it's always good when we can team up. I think, I think when the signal matches fundamentals or front runs fundamentals and gets us to sharpen the saw a little bit more, it's, it only makes us better and, and helps us, our clients make more money, obviously. Exactly. Which is the goal here. We had all three. We had uh, the signal, of course, was earlier in the week on win. Uh, then we got China. Uh, from a signaling and factor exposure perspective to go bullish. Um, so we had a big macro catalyst, which is also the subject matter of the early look note this morning. We're getting like big breakouts and big things like a oil, China, like those are huge things. Uh, India is not a new breakout. That's a bull market that we've been long since June of last year, right? One of the best asset allocations we've ever made. But these are big things uh, that are happening as you come out of a global recession. So uh, this weekend when people say, well, I mean, people call it a recession, bah, just shut up. You know, sh just shut up. That's what you say. Shut up. I'm going to tell you to shut up. Eh? Focus on the next play, right? Yeah. Well, we had a global recession and we're coming out of it in China. So again, it's not, there's not subject to debate. We had a, a recession in Germany. We're coming out of it. We're same thing. Well, Canada is not as clear, but there are plenty of places, UK, everybody in the UK knows. I mean, in the US, you didn't have one, but you had plenty of recessionary data uh, and or companies that imploded all the while. All right, um, let's go. Uh, I got to keep going here. I'm McGuff. Yeah, good morning. 
Um, I'd love if you, could, if you could tell me what I'm going to be talking about in a couple of days, because I often don't know what the hell I'm going to say until it comes out of my mouth. Um, but uh, I'd say, uh, well, I, you know, why don't you start talking and I'm going to look at a couple of things. I'm going to, I'm going to go to my quantum mechanic and path integral, um, machine here. <laughs> All right. Well, so today is a day I've been waiting for, for about two weeks now. We're having our call with Marcus Limonis, chairman of beyond B Y O N. It's the best idea long. He's also the CEO of camping world holding C W H. Uh, which I'm looking at that stock chart right now. I'm really curious as to what that looks like as far as signal strength. Um, that's on our long bias list, but we are going to talk about that too. And just the punchline on Camping Weld is this guy has been in the down cycle. He's rolled up the industry. He's basically told competitors, these mom and pops, hey, I'm either buying you at three times EBITDA or I'm opening up a dealership down the street. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm putting you out of business, so take it or leave it. Um, so this this guy is just ruthless. I'm really looking forward to in this conversation later today at 12:30. Really getting behind. I, look, we'll ask him the usual questions, but I really want to get behind what makes this guy tick, um, and really understand his motivations. Obviously, a big motivation is his stock price, which he's incentivized on 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 both companies um but uh it should be a really good conversation and then we're following up after the marcus conversation which will be an hour long um with uh mark Cahotis, a friend of the firm uh bull on both of these names um and not just i i'm not a bull on them just because mark is mark has pitched me on them for years and and i haven't gotten on on board i wait until our own research gives me the signal and then ultimately when you give me the signal is when i get really loud uh but uh it should be a great event which i'm really looking forward to so that's on uh byon and cwh both long ideas uh which you know if i'm right on them they're not going up by like you know, 30, 40%. These are very typical Brian McGough multi-baggers. And when they move, they're going to move very swiftly and uh, uh, solidly. Um, but speaking of big moves. I uh, consulted my machine. I think what you're going to be talking about is Gildan. Uh, you think so, huh? It doesn't have to be today, but in the in the coming days crystal balling this thing by sometime next week you're going to be you're going to be saying something very bullish about gildan activewear well jeremy mclean is probably licking his chops right now because that's one of his favorite names and when it's one of his his favorites it's one of mine you know it's funny with this conversation later with mark and marcus you're you're going to have like me on one end the kind of longer term strategic thinker i'm i'm the dreamer right and then you got jeremy there who's the more near-term model focused pragmatic guy who's got to keep my feet on the ground and that's why jeremy and i balance each other out so damn well um but uh jeremy's a big fan feel oh. um but one name i did want to touch on this morning is the real real r-e-a-l is the ticker. Um, it's a best idea long. Um, and this stock is the bone. Let's be clear about that. It's trading at buck uh, seventy five. It's actually ripping now post market because of the quarter the company put up last night. And I'm I'm not going to go through all the nits and picks of the quarter. the The punchline is that the company had a blowout quarter. They restructured their 2025 debt. They generated positive EBITDA for the first time since the company went public, which is ahead of plan. So if if it, like I get so many bears on on the buy side who tell me, oh, now this thing's going bankrupt. It won't make it. It won't make it. You can objectively look at these numbers that this company put up last night and say it's not going to make it. So I, I know we don't like buying on green, but, you know, my message to institutions is that this is a two dollar stock right now. If I'm right on the tail call, it's going to 10 and you just got proof positive that this company is probably going to make it. 
um, very highly likely going to make it. It's about to anniversary a decline in GMV as it cut out low priced negative margin items on its P&L and in its business. It's starting to source supply because uh, this is a supply driven business, not a demand driven business. It's all about the product that they get. This is a company that sells luxury products secondhand. So you can buy a $20,000 Hermes Birkin bag on Real Real. You can buy a $40,000 Rolex watch. Um, and it's all about getting good supply. They're, they're, they're going to start sourcing that from some luxury locations globally instead of just inside the U.S. I think they've got in their back pocket a deal with Keering, which owns Gucci, to be the exclusive off-price retailer for uh, excess Gucci merchandise that can't sell. That's a big kicker. I could go up and down a laundry list of business drivers here, but ultimately... This company just generated $2 million in EBITDA. I know that's nothing, but it had been, you know, it was like negative 20 last year. Um, so very big rate of change. Uh, pod one is going to start to accelerate in about two quarters. Um, and pod two is already accelerating. Pod three looks very good. Their capital uh, expenditures are going down. So free cash flow is going up. Um, and I, I, I just think the pods are going to be going this company's way at a point where we're in a much better quad environment, whether it be quad one or quad two, hopefully quad two names like this really work and they work big in quad two institutions won't be looking at this stock until it triples just because it's a bone and they aren't allowed to buy bones. Um, or at least most of them aren't. Uh, but uh, if you're not an institution, uh, it's one I would seriously look at here. Uh, this was a very big proof positive that this company will continue to exist and exist quite well um, over a tail duration. So we're bullish on the real real, R-E-A-L, best idea long, good day today for us on that one. And that's all I got. I mean, <laughs> this thing, I mean, you I dare you all to pull up a three to five year chart on real R E A L. Just it's going to open your eyes to the possibilities of things. Okay. So there's a lot, and there are a lot of stocks like back to what I said about the recession. I mean, it was a bloody depression in, in McGough's world. Like the, these, and, and I appreciate it. We do appreciate you being on. I know sometimes I'm, you know, doing a little bit too much coaching and not everybody has been coached at a high level. Uh, but, you know, like if you're new to us this week and you've joined us and you're like, oh, that's the firm that was bearish last year. Yeah, but we were also bearish the year before that, you know, and before everything crashed. And uh, we stayed bearish on things that still were bearish last year, which included like basically all of Brian McGough's universe, including his long ideas. So <laughs> it's just, um, it's a thing, right? Like, you know, Wall Street, um, you know, if, if you're watching the comedic, you know, representation of it on CNBC, which is the longest running comedy in cable. You, know, you of course, you, the only thing you see or hear is like about one stock, NVIDIA or SPY or whatever, the Dow and points. I mean, it's just, it's pathetic, right? It's pathetic and it's sad, but here's your opportunity. Your opportunity here is to build a very unique portfolio of long ideas, if that's what you do. Now, if you want to learn how to play the long short game, we're going to help you with that too. Uh, not a lot of people play that game well, by the way, but you know, there, there's a lot to do here. And, and Brian's got a lot of names that you know you could go bullish on here that you know are down 60 80 percent from their cycle highs in 2021 uh real being one of them R E L. uh all right thanks brian uh Thank you. tom yeah i put the um, uh, replay up from the healthcare show yesterday i'm trying to make this uh, more of a, a part of the process and you know, keep you up to date, keep the client up to date, uh, keep myself up to date with a bunch of stuff. The one incremental piece was we had gone back and forth on Progeny, PGNY, a couple of weeks ago. One of the things that fell out from their quarter was, uh, you know, sort of a slower utilization number. What I found in our tracking data uh, as we were looking at it was that their number of providers had had fallen off. So that, that chart's in the deck and, and kind of interesting. And I will put that again in your inbox over the weekend. Uh, and then also a code call out was something that came up through the, the review from yesterday as I was putting some of those slides together. Uh, Life stance flipped uh, flipped over to a quad factor long um, from you know being sort of middling to negative. It's been sort of this high tension stock with 
Hindenburg short, uh, the, the, you know, sort of the recovery, the new CEO sort of making slow-ish progress relative to the price, um, you know, obviously making a pretty substantial turn on cash flow and, and beating the number, which we had previewed pretty explicitly into the number. Um, so from here, right, uh, it's it gets very interesting, I think, from meeting the the demand piece with in-network, um, you know, because you, you can't really uh, support the mental health demand without a network prices. Like, uh, for instance, would be a, a psychiatrist might charge you 750 bucks for a 20 minute visit, say, you know, for a prescription or something. This is not something anybody can afford in any great number. So the they're going to have to get insurers, at least, are going to have to provide some sort of adequate network. That'll mean prices have to go up to somebody like a life stance who gets about 150 bucks, 160 bucks per. They're going to be in demand because those networks are inadequate for in, you know, in network for us as an employer, we're going to go and complain eventually, or in mass, people are going to complain, Hey, we, I can't get, I can't get somebody to see my kid. Right. Um, and that's all going to come back around. So I think, I think we're in this stage where mental health is being, normalize already has but now we're now we're on to the stage well how do you actually see somebody how do you actually uh get paid get access and you know have this whole thing actually function because it doesn't right now because you know x x huge percentage of um mental health professionals are out of network and they're asking you to pay cash uh and which is it doesn't isn't going to work for the vast vast majority of people but that that but flipping to quad factor positive um, also, the macro call with sort of the higher beta, smaller cap, you know, the progression that you guys are laying after this year, this is kind of perfect, you know, from a factor exposure perspective. But that was flipping positive was a, a new chart that I had in the in that healthcare show from yesterday. That's it. The the name that's if I had to buy one name that's on your list, that's you know, because again, it's my my scoring of that is bullish trade, bullish trend, low into the range. If I have all three of those things, I want to buy it. And I want to buy it actually more aggressively than if obviously it was in the middle of its range. But uh, Elevance, ELV, um, I have no idea what they do, um, but <laughs> I know what the ticker's doing. All right. I will, I will get on. That's a managed care. Um, you know, not, not my comfort zone uh in terms of in terms of how that functions that's really been a yield play for the most part so if you're bullish yield um their net income margin essentially or, or the 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 uh what they're compounding off you know the the fixed the capital costs of uh on the premiums that they're making a yield on on uh, the net interest margin side that's very you know highly leverageable the medical cost trend accelerating finds its way through premium inflation. So that's also positive. And they tend to be really good if you're big enough to price at a spread. Obviously, we've had some issues with Humana and United Healthcare talking about that, um, maybe not pricing to trend. But if a trend is accelerating, like I think it is, that's eventually going to find its way through on a, on a premium. Um, the other piece, of that, I mean, there's obviously a whole ton of, I don't want to, I don't want to off the cuff here. And Emily knows a lot about this as well in terms of the Medicare Advantage uh, marketplace how penetrated that is but i will there's no no reason why i can't do some work and, and flip you back uh sort of similar to patterson pdco get that to you in short order okay good thank you uh emily hey uh good morning keith um yeah uh elevance is a big medicaid um uh piece which is uh, you know, i've talked about this a lot it it's not the expectation was that it would lose members um it is not moving, losing them as fast as we thought, and it's not returning to its baseline of uh, 64 million people before the pandemic. Uh, this is one of the creative ways in which the government is able to keep printing money by pouring it into these mandatory programs, which makes your uh, MCOs happy, which uh, in turn makes your, uh, your providers happy, which Healthcare is twenty percent of GDP, so this is this is a trick that uh, that uh, it's well documented that the um, Obama administration used in the post uh, Great Financial. 
crisis period uh, and and with the benefit of the Affordable Care Act. That's that's not political. That's documented. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> moving on. Unless you had any questions about that. No. Just, okay. The. Uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, two two other things. Number one, um, there is a study uh, making the rounds amongst the TV doctor crowd that the American Heart Association released just uh, within the last couple of days uh, that concludes that tw uh, that people who smoke or take cannabis in some form uh, are twenty five percent more likely to uh, to experience a cardiac adverse cardiac event. Uh, it's a crappy study. It's based on a survey. Uh, it is, uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't segment populations, you know, are people, are people smoking weed every day for something that has nothing to do with, with, you know, recreational use is there, we don't know. So, but it's making the rounds, it's hitting the headlines and, and that's why I mentioned it. Um, it's just, it's it's just not a great great study. The um, but the the I think the point the American Heart Association is trying to make anyway is we don't have a ton of great longitudinal data um, on regular use of of THC cannabis. It's still it's it's being developed. It's just not not quite there yet, and that's why you get you know these kind of crappy studies um, jumping in there. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Pfizer had their big oncology day yesterday, uh, and now 40% of their employees are dedicated to the oncology sector, uh, and they are banking a hell of a lot on their CGEN acquisition. Execution is going to be important. I point this out because if you compare what Moderna is doing, which is seriously doubling down, on uh, on the mRNA platform that they used for development of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, uh, and they're trying to extrapolate that to other uses. Pfizer is doing pretty much the opposite and starving that uh, that that function in favor of uh, oncology. Uh, that that should tell you a lot of what you need to know about Moderna. I can't believe I'm saying anything nice about Pfizer, but uh, but 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 there I am. So that's it. The only thing I'm going to say nice about Pfizer is that it's been a nice short. <laughs> well, and it still might be. I'm I'm this. The, they are putting, uh, you know, this is a what a 65 60 billion dollar company. They're putting a lot of eggs in their CGN basket. Which is not great, but we can talk about that another day. I, 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 so that's it. Yeah, it's um, it acted great on the short side yesterday. Apple did. There are plenty of shorts. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, like we're not bullish or bearish. We're executing on the process, and there's always a bull or bear market somewhere. All right. Thanks, Stein Bomber. Morning. So I want to um, I want to hit on a couple things that are basically the same thing this morning. It's a follow-up to the presentation we gave yesterday on uh, consumer credit. Uh, I think the presentation was really good. And uh, anybody who's uh, at all interested either in these companies or the space or even more broadly uh, should definitely check it out. Um, the couple of the key takeaways is that uh, one, uh, consumer credit trends appear to be stabilizing. So uh, early cycle indicators uh, are all getting now less bad in rate of change terms. So obviously that's a positive. Uh, we went through uh, an absolute ton of data uh, that looked at that through a number of different lenses. Uh, however, in the short term, there is an event risk coming up uh, quite quickly. Um, the CFPB, and I know Drago talked about this while I was uh, out, but the CFPB is going to uh, most likely issue its uh, ruling, its final ruling around uh, credit card late fees uh, and the fact that it doesn't think they're fair uh, before the State of the Union address. So the State of the Union is next week on Thursday. Um, I think this ruling by the CFPB uh, is the timing is not coincidental. It's going to give uh, President Biden something to talk about. Um, and 
So yeah, basically what the CFPB is expected to rule is that the current $40 uh, credit card late fee regime, which generates about $12 billion in revenue for the industry, uh, should be cut by uh, 75%. And late fees shouldn't be more than $8. Um, so the impact to pre-tax income uh, for the three companies most affected by this, uh, Discover stands to lose about 15% of its pre-tax income. Uh, Synchrony, uh, 24, almost 25% of its pre-tax income and Capital One, uh, 27%. To give you just one crazy number, uh, Synchrony uh, last year generated 2.7 billion in late fees uh, and its pre-tax income was 2.9 billion. And the CFPB wants to take that down by 75%. So. Uh, the good news for them is that they lay off uh, the majority, in fact, of that to their retail partners. Uh, so that hedges them a bit. But um, the point is that this announcement will probably come early next week, either Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, most likely. Uh, and I think, you know, even though it's decently uh, known, I think it's, it's still going to be a shot across the bow, a big one. And I think there's likely to be uh, short term event risk in these stocks uh, ahead of that. So uh, anyway, I wanted to sort of frame up both the short term and the intermediate term uh, setups here very briefly, but people who are interested should go and check out uh, the replay of our call we hosted yesterday. That's it for me this morning. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised yesterday to see our asset allocation to housing hit a new high. Uh, it, all it took was a, a kind of like a dovish uh, response or hope uh, is a better way to characterize it post the PCE number on bond yields. All bond yields did, of course, is come off the top end of the range towards the low end of the range, which is um, you still get those rate sensitive moves in housing. And it's a uh, it's a great portfolio piece, Steiner, because that's what a portfolio should be. It should be diversified and also be asymmetric. Uh, look that up if you haven't heard of that before, i.e. your portfolio isn't just like NVIDIA and moon, moon and laser beams. It's got stuff that goes up on days when other things go down. And, um, you know, that's that's been a good piece. It's been much better. So, for example, like a lot of people that, you know, most people in their retirement accounts have like a 60-40 uh, and have a lot of duration or bond exposure. Um, we don't have any. You know, we're long short-term, very short-term bills, T-bills, uh, ball hoggers, you know, the, what I call them again, where you're, today's payday, by the way, where we're getting paid our anywhere between 47 to 5% risk-free. Uh, but we're long housing. I mean, that's that's been a good one, man. I, I I don't know what drove that other than the rates move. Was there news on certain builders yesterday? I mean, uh, you know, Lenar's acted really well on my signal. Uh, yeah, no, there wasn't uh, any big news. I mean, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, and I've talked about this before, but, you know, housing is a pretty boring sector, uh, but it's outperformed uh, tech since 2019, which is pretty wild. It's actually the only sector that's outperformed tech since 2019. And the reason for that is because there is still a massive uh, structural uh, supply shortage uh, in the housing sector. And that, you know, we do these quarterly calls uh, with Ed Pinto and he sort of goes through, you know, the, the nightmare prospect of trying to increase uh, you know, density and, and uh, planning and how difficult it is to permit just about anything anywhere these days. Uh, and, you know, you got to go through that. You look at the household formation rates relative to the construction uh, rates, you look at the demographics, and none of that is poised anytime soon to change. And so uh, the, the tailwinds are there. Um, but then in the short term, as we also have talked about, housing itself reduces to this one factor model around rates. Right? It's just a bond proxy. And so uh, on the one hand, you have that longer term, very powerful tailwind. But in the short term, it really just becomes a play on rates. Yeah, and that's uh, definitely how, how it acted yesterday. So that's a nice offset. And in a long short book, it is as well, because, you know, like I'm short, um, I'm only short two things from a U.S. equity sector perspective, which has got to be the low for a while now, which is utilities and regional banks. And in regional banks just quickly. I mean, it, so I, that goes back to payday today because we get the NYCB down like what another thirty percent. I mean, was it, was anything incremental there, or was it just more of the same? 
Uh, well, yeah. So they um, basically the, they fired their CEO, and uh, the reason they did that uh, is because they discovered um, internal control problems with respect to uh, their loan uh, risk evaluation uh, process. <laughs> so. Oh wow. Yeah. So they um, they replaced him. Uh, they made the executive chairman, uh, the interim CEO. So that stock, uh, which already, of course, had lost, you know, more than half its value down this morning, uh, between 20 and 30 percent, depending on uh, depending on the, the minute. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the hits uh, just keep on coming for New York community. I think more broadly with with regionals, you know, the, the backdrop here is going to be more challenging than what I just described for the consumer finance sector, because obviously uh, this commercial real estate office uh, exposure overhang, uh, it's it's not going to hit like a tsunami for the sector all at once. Instead, it's just going to you know hit uh, more idiosyncratically. But the concern is going to be you know who and when, right? And so that's just going to basically cast a long shadow over the sector for the better part of the upcoming year. Uh, so. It'll be, you know, it'll be a struggle uh, for the for the regional banks uh, relative, you know, to more broadly uh, either the financial sector, or the broader market. So, yeah, that, we're just going to kind of get these episodic updates from different companies that aren't great uh, over the course of, you know, the next three or four earnings reporting se seasons. Yeah. Another tough one for Drawdown, Josh Brown. He's um... I guess he went into one of the banks and he liked what he saw. Uh, I mean, really, dude, it's so bad, so bad. Um, the retail community that bought that based on the CNBC clowns, I mean, I guess I mean, to his credit, he wouldn't really know if a financial firm didn't have internal controls because he used to work at a boiler room brokerage that got basically decayed by the by the police and shut down so he wouldn't know i mean it, you got to give you, you got to feel bad for the guy a little bit sometimes okay. um thank you rob yeah got no rob simone today oh no keith sorry i was on mute i'm here sorry about that i'm here i was talking but didn't pick it up uh no i'm uh it's it's kind of quiet uh in the sense that i'm just playing catch up after earnings after like uh marketing for the last couple of days but uh <laughs> last last night mpw did uh file their 10k which is always a um a labor of of love i guess you could call it one one call out um this is wild <laughs> so the uh the auditor letter uh, first of all that like the lawyers basically tore up and rewrote the entire 10k which is which is hilarious um Lots of billable, <laughs> lots of billable hours there. I mean, I, I used to say that only the MPW's management team was winning in this whole thing, but now, like, you could probably add the lawyers to that. Um, just, uh, just incredible. I did a black line of the the K versus. It's basically like the whole risk section was just deleted, like lined out and completely rewritten. Um, really? Oh, it's it's nuts. It's it, well, that, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but like a a significant portion of it. Um. In the uh, the auditor's letter, the one thing that I wanted to highlight and that's that's really meaningful for this company, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their uh, their debt covenants, you know, spe specifically the revolver covenants, um, they have a tangible net worth test that's a maintenance covenant. And they have about, on my numbers, call it like $900 million of flexibility uh, before they would trip that covenant or need a waiver. And obviously, they don't have the ability to sell equity right now. Um if you think through that number, that 900 million, they're, they're carrying on their books, uh, call it, you know, um, over a billion, if you include the Macquarie, the book value of the Macquarie JV, over a billion dollars of investments still in Steward and another 700 million in prospect, like the majority of which, if not all of that, I, I, I believe is worthless. So get a load of this. Um, when you read the auditor's letter, they they did take seven hundred million dollars of impairments in the quarter related to steward, but they left uh, you know the book value that that over a billion dollars remaining outstanding because they valued steward using a revenue multiple approach. 
um which is just phen- phenomenal but like I, I like okay great like let's let's just watch how that one ends because that is that is tremendous i uh, like i mean really like I hope PW the PWC, if there's anyone on PWC from PWC on the call this morning, uh go get yourself a lawyer today because when this blows up, it will there there's almost like in to my mind, like the collateral damage here is gonna be epic. And and that is outrageous. Like that entity is worthless. And you're using revenue multiples to justify avoiding MPW taking write downs. I, I wonder how the bank group feels about that. I wonder how um, you know the state of Massachusetts feels about that, and and all the doctors and nurses, et cetera. But like, let's let's just watch how that one plays out. It is going to be phenomenal to watch. So anyway, just wanted to highlight that, and phenomenal in a bad way, to be clear. Do you have a? Um... Do you have the names of the people from oh. so, sorry, you you broke up there, Keith. I, I I missed that. I said, do you have the individual names of the people from did you say Price Waterhouse that put that did this? I I I don't um uh I believe that the 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 audit partner for PwC but by the way that the it's it's of course audited by the local Birmingham office um let's just throw that one in there oh um, nice of course yeah, yeah yeah that that's a fun one too I'd love to uh you know I'd love to sit in on that um you know that golf club dining room conversation about three weeks ago that would have been a fun one just to be a fly on the wall but uh the guy's name is Sparks or yeah, he was the old audit partner. I think they may have actually gotten a new one. Um, but but candidly, I don't know their names. I just know that they've had the same auditor for basically their entire existence. They used the local Birmingham office and they used a revenue multiple on Steward, on a worthless steward that is currently under a forbearance agreement with its ABL lenders, aka it's in default. They used a revenue multiple to value steward and determined that MPW had a billion dollars of value justified on its balance sheet. I look like again, let's just watch that one play out. That that's what I would posit to the world. Well, let's also make it come to life. I mean, think of all the times that everyone listening to this has heard about auditors or self-dealing, um, well, self-dealing auditors that have over have, have cleanly overseen things like Enron or something like this. And there's never really a name, right? There's So let's find the names. I want to know, like, if it's Sparks, I want to know who the person is that runs the PwC. Terry Birmingham Sparks. Office. Terry Sparks. That's I the guy's to... name, Terry. And does he run the Birmingham office? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure. Let's find him. I want his name. I want, and I also want the, the person that the, that he reports to. Um, there's going to be, you know, if the government's not going to do anything, we'll do something. Uh, Crazy. It's, it's nuts. It's, it's, it's nuts. And it's, it's it, like, it's criminal. Like, I mean, really that, that is, we have a company that's under a forbearance agreement with its lenders that is using, it's crazy. <laughs> we got it. I mean, it's so, so let's, let's start making it more real for these people, uh, and holding them to account. Again, if we're going to live in a country where the authorities don't want to do that, then We'll still do. We have communication uh, platforms that can certainly hold people to account. And uh, for the, you, the people out there, you know, participate. You know, sitting idle is what people do in communist countries, uh, in countries where you don't give a fuck, right? We care about liberty. We care about the rule of law. You need to care, right? Help us. Yeah, you know, this is this is wrong. It's just wrong. It's wrong. Right? It's just we got to keep going. Here. It's wrong. Yeah. It's uh, awful. I mean, Jay, uh, I'll flip to Jay. Jay Van Skyver, how many times, and we're not with the first year, but how many, uh, I've read a lot of K's and Q's, 10 K's. How many times have you read a 10 K where the whole, where the thing is essentially, you know, completely changed in the risk section like that? That I haven't, that's not a frequent thing. Oh, it, it's a great indicator of a uh, stock that's about to go down. Uh, I remember um, when Sarbanes Oxley uh, came out in the early aughts, right? You saw uh, GE, for example, their 10K went from like 
80 pages to like 300 pages like it was uh yeah people afraid about going to jail and suddenly started disclosing a bunch of things um you know we uh you know for, for the benefit of people on the call who don't know we're in 10k season so you're going to hear a lot more about auditors and audit letters and uh you know disclosures risks and stuff than you normally would on the call um we have one out this morning uh which i'll which i'll talk about in a sec but um yeah it's a uh, it's an important source it's it uh, sec filings are where companies typically you know try and tell the truth because they can be held to account for that on a different level than they can in a press release which is more you know fluffy and friendly and bullish right uh, the bad news will be in the K's and Q's. Um, so we're back from, what well, I would say it was three absolutely packed days of meetings in London. Uh, good good round. A uh, li little wiped out from it, but we have our uh, show today at 10 a.m., at 11 a.m., uh, the industrial show. Uh, we'll go through Beacon's pre-announcement. We'll go through um, uh, some things on the emissions deck and some things in the ag deck. Then at 2 p.m., we're going to go through uh, the Agpocalypse Part 2, uh, the biofuels edition, uh, looking at uh, uh, biodiesel and sustainable aviation fuel, uh, which are kind of the pushbacks we got to the ethanol bear case. So, you know, we'll, we'll explain why. Uh, basically, we, we didn't spend a lot of time in them in the first deck and uh, what we see going on there. Uh, so that's worthwhile. One thing that's out this morning is uh, Plug Power, uh, which uh, reported a pretty sizable loss and disappointment. Uh, the funny thing is they did release their 10K before the press release uh, because I, they were moving the going concern language. It was in their 10Q last quarter, right? So last quarter they said, we might go bankrupt. And now they're saying, we're not going to go bankrupt in this operating cycle. And that's because they sold $1.3 billion of stock for cash, right? So they're gonna burn uh, that cash. And to put that in context, this is a company with a $2.4 billion market cap. So the dilution is is, is just massive. Uh, but you know, for an investor, issuing stock to fund operating losses isn't exactly the going concern removal that they think it is, right? That isn't really yeah. what companies are supposed to. It's one thing if you're like issuing stock to build a capital asset that'll last for a long time but just you know funding uh the purchase of something to sell it at a loss is is not that great the, the other thing that just jumps out is that gross profit or gross loss increased by more than revenue right like you should at least be able to buy and resell something at like roughly break even not at uh you know an enormous loss so uh that is just a mess of an earnings release. I think the company thought the removal of going concern language would make the stock go up. It's down, I don't know, eight, 10% in pre-market. Uh, that call is, is starting now, but uh, you know, eventually if the economy reaccelerates, probably drop shorts like plug, but it is uh, not, not a real going concern. Uh, I'll leave it there. Again, like I, I said earlier in the week, you were, while well, you were in London, um, you know, I had a dream, you know, it's not, I wasn't trying to be MLK, obviously, but I, my, one of my dreams is that, and it's still manifesting here in reality, is that we're going to be some version of the police as a community, right? The hedge eye community is growing at a faster rate the, you know, to have people on free access week. We got a lot of people that are watching this. And when people corporate white collar you you know i don't know if you're going to call what uh, plug power I, I wouldn't call it white collar crime but you'd certainly say it lacks principle to the core where again they sell you stock right whether plug power whoever bought that stock is a pension fund a mutual fund a index fund they they sell you stock they pay themselves compensation and then they burn the cash that's it that's just that's the, the thing. It's not People even can... being the police. It's just like that's what's going on. It's just we're not. You're just telling the truth. <laughs> the financials are hilarious. It's like stand up and part of the financials. Part of the burn is what they pay themselves, right? I mean, so it's it lacks principle to the core. People for so long have, 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 they don't trust Wall Street for these, these reasons, but. Now they're going to get a fine appreciation for the names of people at specific companies that are doing 
particular particular things that we're monitoring in real time. All right. So great job with that one. That's been a, one of the great shorts in Hedge Eye history, Plug Power. And uh, to those of you that have ran that company into the ground, shame on you. All right. Um, Friedman. Yep. Morning. Uh, so we had Fubo earnings out this morning, uh, which is still a short of ours. Uh, the stock's up uh, pre-market on a headline EBITDA beat, uh, but digging through the numbers here, the fundamental story remains the same. Uh, total subscriber growth uh, slowed to 8.5% in Q4. Uh, that's from 19% in Q3 and 42% in the fourth quarter of 22, so the year ago period. They guided uh, fiscal year 2024. They operate on a calendar year, uh, but 2024 subscriber growth guide uh, to only 2.8%. <clears throat> So further deceleration, uh, which is a problem for a high churn business model. Uh, they talk about gross margins being positive on a gap basis, but what they don't include in their COGS, but should is broadcasting and transmission costs about 15.5 million. So if we add that back and, com you, and comparing it to subscription revenue, you get a 0% gross margin business on the, on the subscription side. So not really seeing much evidence of scale um, that's needed to really turn this business around. Again, we think it's a broken business model and that they can't, there's real no path to profitability here. And on that point for the year, gap operating loss was two, uh, 289 million, uh, which was a slight improvement, um, or sorry, an improvement rather versus 22 of 411 million uh, on cost cutting efforts, but still deeply, deeply negative. The company burned about 195 million in cash in 2024. They have uh, sorry, in 2023, they have $245 million in cash on the balance sheet. Uh, they say that they are on track to hit positive free cash flow targets by 2025. I just still don't know how they get there. So I think between now um, and then, they're going to have to raise equity capital again in the first half of this year, which will be further diluted to the stock and then, then you know, likely miss their free cash flow positive targets, uh, unless if they do some type of you know, transformative deal, uh, which again, I think is uh, not likely. So uh, still short Fubo, um, uh, the call's uh, happening as we speak. So I'll have to hop on that. Yeah, that thing's a raging POS too. I mean, <laughs> Fridays, I guess we're just rolling out all the pieces of shit that we've shorted. <laughs> Plugged power, <laughs> MPW, Fubo. I mean, man, but those executives sold you all stock. Not everybody on the call, of course. You know what I mean. Um, Felix, I see you on, but you're not supposed to be on. Or did you want to say something? Nope. All right. He's just multitasking because I think he's on a client call. Um, no Glenn here today, so no bad jokes, JT. Oh, God. What a great way to start the weekend. <laughs> Uh, Although he did, he did slip one into that email to us. He so always, I was like, oh, he can't. He just can't help himself. That's the problem. He just can't help himself. That guy. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, so we did avert yet another uh, shutdown, Keith. Uh, oh, oh, thank God! Thank now, you God. know they saved us from themselves uh, again. Again, again. would that cost another money. half a trillion dollars? Yeah, uh, just, I was thinking about this. It was like if you or I you know, showed up at work every day and didn't do our jobs, right? What would our clients do, right? They drop us in a heartbeat if we didn't put in the work, didn't put in the time. It's like we're five months into the fiscal year. They're still dilly-dallying with this. And then they're going to turn around. They're going to need to start 2025, you know, in, in, in within a matter of weeks, it's 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 ludicrous that it's it's gone on to March now and and maybe even trickle on to April, and then they take these recesses just to get everyone here and just get it done. You know this is Congress. This is what this is what we're paying for, right? And this is probably the again, pox on both of their houses. Probably the lowest productivity Congress in uh, in decades, if not ever. Ever do nothing, think... Congress. So, um, yeah. but. Of the remaining things that we're going to be looking at in March, Keith is going to be finishing up these bills first and foremost. And it looks as if the I'd probably say there's a 50, 60 percent chance, maybe 60 percent chance they get six of these bills passed next week. And then on to the tougher ones, which have a uh, timeline of March 22nd. In that time frame, they're going to have to make some decisions on that tax bill that we talked about, the child care tax credit, coupled with the business tax breaks. That's sort of in limbo in the Senate and just getting a lot of pushback. It was passed by part in the bipartisan way in the House. 
getting a lot of pushback from mainly Republican senators in the Senate. That's going to be up in the air in March, as well as foreign aid. My prediction is, at least on the foreign aid side, that Johnson will end up doing what he's done on these spending bills, which is probably looking for a majority of his conference, coupled with Democrats, maybe even attaching it to the spending bill um, in late March and getting that done and moving on. Why, why take two tough votes when you can combine it? And for the time being, at the beginning of the week, I said, you know, what sort of the path forward for, for Johnson and others is going to be determined as to whether he sides with the Freedom Caucus types or sort of the bulk of his conference and just getting stuff done. Like this will be, again, not just lowest productivity Congress, but it'll probably we'll probably start stop legislating in March, April. I, I think May is a big push. Typically in an election year, you see them passing some stuff in the summertime before just calling it quits for an election year. I think this is going to be unlike any other any other year, and they're going to stop legislating. And it's just tough. I mean, Johnson's got a two seat majority, and what can you possibly pass? And, 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 and Schumer's got a one seat majority. What can you possibly pass in this environment um, uh, in an election year? So uh, that those are the three things that, that'll be up to the rest of the spending bills, the tax bill, which I know a lot of guys, clients are, are watching. And of course, this foreign aid piece that I think you know, with McConnell's retirement here, I think that's going to be one of the last things he wants to try to get uh, done before all is said and done. And that might be the last tranche of foreign funding we've seen quite some time. And that's it, Pete. Mm, that's a lot. <clears throat> yeah, we hit on the rule of law. We hit on, like, look, I got I got this flag behind me. I'm Canadian, right? And I'm trying to get all of you to, to participate, you know, to, to wake people up. Like JT said earlier in the week, and thanks for joining us throughout the week, you know, go up to somebody in the grocery store, go up to your congressman, go up to somebody and just like, Remind them that the inflation in the grocery store is a function of the deficit and the debt. I mean, just going on and on and on. It's not going to be. You might like the color and you might like, you know, you might. I mean, I have a Canadian flag tattooed on my back, but I don't like their politics. I mean, you might like you might like the look of that American flag. And it stands for a lot more than a lot of other countries. But, man, it's not a perpetuity if you don't do something. Right. So something to think about. Thanks for joining us for this week. We appreciate it and for all of our uh, Hedgeye subscribers in our community. Uh, we'll see you again on Monday.